here. For the past few days, we talked about how we are on a journey on this earth, and we saw some of the things that we encounter in this world that makes it challenging for us sometimes in the world that we live in. But in today's lesson, we have reached to the point to where we are ready to pass through heaven and we are standing right at the border before we would go into heaven. And I wanted to start with the question, how many of you have been in a foreign country? Probably several people have, have been in a, in a foreign country. So um, for those of you that have not, as soon as you are about to cross the border, um, especially if you go to the front door, um, you encounter um, this department called the U.S. Customs and Border Protection. And in order to get back in the country, you have to go through customs, and uh, customs has a very specific job. They are not to let in the country things that shouldn't be in the country. And um, they, um, like for instance, this is a bunch of watches, supposed to be Rolex, but they're probably fake. Um, somebody thought it's a great idea to bring this stuff in the country, but you cannot bring um, some items in this country, and guess what? Fake Rolex watches are one of the items. Some people decide to bring other items, such as Indian star tortoises. We have a tortoise at home, but it's not an Indian tortoise. It's a desert tortoise. They're cute things, but they're not allowed in this country. So you can't just bring whatever you, you want to bring in this country. And people try to smuggle all kinds of things that they shouldn't in this country, such as bats. This is a bat, so very cute little rare bats apparently that somebody tried to smuggle through without um, customs finding them. This is a, um, some people like to buy this fancy frogs. And there's many other things that people try to bring in this country that are, that are illegal. There are really thousands of things that you cannot bring in this country. Um, so the day will come, uh, spiritually speaking, when we're going to be ready to enter into the kingdom of God. And certainly, we know that there are certain things you cannot bring with you um, in heaven. So the Bible tells us there are a few things that we cannot take with us in heaven. So today, for the time that I have left, we're going to talk about three things that you can't bring with you in heaven. And those three things, we're going to go one by one, but the first one is your sins. And we're going to expand on that a bit, the fact that if you have sins, you cannot go into heaven with sins. And everybody will say, yep, we agree. The second one is that you can't bring in somebody else's sins, and we'll see how we're going to cover that. And the third one is that you cannot bring other people um, in heaven against their will. Um, people have got to want to go to heaven on their own. So the first one is that um, our own sin we cannot bring into, he uh, into heaven. And a passage in Isaiah says, Your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you, so he does not hear. We've we, we've known, if you've been in the church for, for a while, you've been studying the Bible for a while, you know that sin is in between you and, and God. And you cannot be joined to God. There's no place in heaven for hell. If you have hell, uh, sin in your life, um, it, 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 it will not be allowed in heaven because sin is not compatible with heaven. Um, sin will not be allowed to be in heaven. So... In order for us to be able to come into God's presence, our sin needs to be removed. 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, we read that if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses us from all sins. So the blood of Jesus makes us acceptable in God's sight as it's only through the blood of Christ that we can have access into the kingdom of heaven. Many people, unfortunately, um, don't want to give up their sins. They like their sins. They like their adultery. They like their cheating. They like their stealing and their lying. And um, So many times they believe they can hide those sins away so that maybe God won't see them. And um, when it comes to U.S. customs, um, there are people who know that there are certain things you're not supposed to bring in the country. They bring them anyway. Uh, sometimes they get caught. Sometimes they don't, I guess. But um, 
What are you supposed to do with those forbidden, forbidden things if they want to bring them in the, in, the, in the country? They hide them, right? They try to hide them. Um, and I have a few pictures here. This is five pounds of cocaine. Somebody was, um, are you familiar with this kinds of smuggling operations? They hide them. And sometimes they pass them through, sometimes they don't. It's just mind boggling. And it's very sad that our southern border is so porous that there's so much smuggling is happening. And when you hear about the oldest story with the fentanyl and how much things that shouldn't be in this country, um, it's, it's very sad. Um, I. I had to go through a medical procedure a couple of weeks ago, and uh, they gave me fentanyl, of all things, to put me under. And very little bit of fentanyl, and I was out for like two days. I don't know how those people take those for fun. But um, yes, so um, this is another clever um, way to hide uh, drugs and things shouldn't be, should, shouldn't be brought in this country. This is another classic way of somebody smuggling and being like a meal, what they call it. Um, and it is very life-threatening. This is my favorite one because they put these birds. They found 24 critically endangered cockatoos, and they were rescued by police being stuffed in water bottles for illegal trade. Sad uh, life. This is how it's supposed to look. But people bring all kinds of things. I think this is the last one that I have here for you. Somebody was clever to bring a dog, um, put them in that kind of container. But... The reason these folks try to do this is because occasionally people actually can, get, can pass through and it works for them to be able to, um, to smuggle things into this country that shouldn't be here. But none of us will be able to slip into heaven with hidden sins. If you have hidden sins in your life, um, it's not going to... God is much more... Um, um, much more... Uh, a lot better than our... Custom border agents, right? And it's not, you cannot smuggle a sin into heaven. Um, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 10 says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of Him who we must give an account. Nothing is hidden before Him. Another passage, he says that God knows not just the thoughts but the intent of the thoughts like before we even think something he knows what we're thinking before we even are starting to put those those thoughts together so we can't really hide any sins from god because he knows everything about us god knows every thought every word every action that you've ever taken every word you've ever said so there's no hiding from god when it comes to your sins akon if you remember him, he tried to be smart and hide some things that he stole from a, from a battlefield and things didn't go too well for him. Nobody saw that he stole some things he shouldn't have. Nobody, not even Joshua, knew what was happening. But then God revealed to Joshua that um, there's sin in the camp. And uh, we know what happened with him. Um, in verse 21 there, he says at the end what he confesses when his lots came on him. He says, when I saw among the spoils a beautiful Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold weighing 50 shekels, I coveted and I took them and I hid them. And he thought for sure, nobody will know. It's my sin. It's just between me and nobody. Maybe you even th didn't think maybe even God knew. So one thing we learn from this is that we cannot hide sin from God. So, and this is an encouragement that I have for you today to really meditate, pray on this, and to see whatever hidden sin you have that maybe you think only you know about, or maybe just if you and God knows about, somehow it's going to be okay, um, that we ought to cut all sin, including hidden sin, from our life. Because sin is, regardless if it's hidden, if you think only you know about it, it will prevent us from going to heaven. Hebrews chapter 3 verse 13 says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and lay bare before the eyes of whom, to whom we must give an account to. Nothing in all creation is hidden from Him. And I don't know how God just knows. God knows everything. And... Um, it's just, we should just know that God sees everything. There is a vision that John has in the book of Revelation. 
with the wheel, if you remember, that had eyes on all sides. And it just had this, this vision of there's the eyes of God which are everywhere. There's no way in which you can turn to somehow escape the eyes of God. Um, so just think about that. So God wants to help us, however, remove those sins. God has no pleasure in allowing that sin to persist in our life and then, and then losing our souls over it. So God intends for our sins that we confront those sins, we deal with those sins and we remove those sins from us. In John chapter 1, God there reassures us that if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us, forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So yes, we all sin, but it doesn't end there because God is willing to forgive us. It's willing to take that sin away. And that's really why He gave His Son for that to occur. So, as I mentioned, the good news is that the closer we walk with God, the fewer sins we'll have in, your li in our lives. You know, it doesn't apply all the time. Sometimes it's not the case, but as a principle, it's true. The longer you, wake, you walk with God, the longer that you spend time with God, the less one person should sin. Every Christian falls down in their faith once in a while, but as I mentioned, the the longer we walk with Christ, the less often we fall down. And I have an example of um, someone learning how to skate. Anybody knows how to skate here? I used to skate when I was younger and a lot more foolish. And I fell so many times. And then I said, okay, I'm not going to even do this. And if it wasn't a fall, it's just, it's just so very strenuous ex, uh, type of sport. It's not an easy sport. Um, but... When you first learn how to skate, you fall a lot, don't you? Right? I took my kids skating a year or two ago, and they were falling down. They thought they were so good, and they were on the ice all the time. And I was just so careful because I know how bad it hurts when you fall on ice. So, um, yeah, so when we first learn how to skate, you fall down a lot. So, but then if you watch a professional skater... They fall down, a, they don't fall down a lot too, although they've had their share of falling down. And if you can imagine sometimes all the things they do in the air and they still don't fall. Um, you may ask yourself, how can they skate like that? And that's because they skate so much that they pretty much like constantly like walking to them is being on skates. And it is, becomes as natural as breathing for them to be on skates. And the same thing with us. If we are so, so comfortable to, to be the kind of Christian that we ought to be before God, after a while, it gets easier to not fall, to not sin before God. So, as I mentioned, it's the same way, even with the most seasoned Christians, sometimes they fall down once in a while, but they fall down less often than when they first became, became Christians, right? And... That is just the fact of life. And every time, every step of the way, God is working in their lives to free more and more sin from their life. So the more you stay in the faith, the, the more zeal you, you have for God, the more sin is being trimmed for your life. And as you go through life, as you approach closer and closer of the time when it's ready for you to, to go to heaven, your sin should become smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller, and you should become better and better and better at mastering um, temptations and, and all kinds of vices that you don't fall for sin so much, um, right? So our sin, as I mentioned, that is one thing you cannot bring into heaven. The second thing we can bring into heaven is the sins of others. And you may say, well, how in the world can you carry the sins of others in heaven? And there is a way you can carry the sins of others into, you could try, um, into heaven. Um, and that is the sins of others when you don't forgive them. In Matthew chapter 6, Jesus there says, If you do not forgive men their trespasses, neither your Father will forgive your trespasses. So, it's not that we don't like the idea of forgiveness. We all want to be forgiven. It's just that when it comes to about when somebody's hurting us or is causing something that's really painful to us, and I don't know if you've ever 
if you've ever experienced an emotional event where somebody really harmed you and then you really had a hard time forgiving that person. Um, I don't know, you don't have to a a raise your hands, but you know, I'm sure you probably have. My most, the closest to that to me was when I was second year medical school student, I think you're already out of Romania at that time, that I had this, um, I'll never forget, um, I had a professor of genetics and um, you know, kids, I was not very smart at the time. I just became a Christian. I was kind of foolish and speaking when I shouldn't. And um, I was talking with some friends and I said something about, oh, this teacher, you know, he takes, she takes bribes to pass other students. And I said something derogatory towards a teacher. And um, I go to the, to, the, to the, I don't even, even my wife knows this. And I want to, to take my exam and the lady says, you fail. You don't even have to say nothing. By the way, back in Romania, teachers can do that. Over here, I don't think they can. And they have such power that you, they can, she said to me, because you said that about me, I'm not gonna let you pass the year. So she made me repeat the entire year of medical school. So medical school in Romania, six years, I did seven because of I said something I shouldn't have said. And I had the hardest time, the hardest time forgiving that person because a whole year you have to do it all over. It's not like in this country. In this country, just carry that course over, right? So, I don't know, maybe you had an experience like that, that you had a really hard time to forgive others and you, you look forward to just that person really suffering for what they did to you. And that is just a, a little thing. Could be even a greater sin of somebody harming your family, for instance. And it's very hard. It can be very hard to forgive others. So, as I mentioned, forgiveness is not easy. In fact, sometimes forgiveness may be the most difficult things we do, although we desperately need to forgive others. Jesus teaches us that we ought to forgive others on the basis of His forgiveness, the fact that He has forgiven us. Therefore, we ought to forgive others out of grace, out of mercy, and not because they deserve it. We don't forgive others because they deserve to be forgiven. Because if that's the case, you may not forgive that person. And then if you don't forgive them, God will not forgive your sins. So, we have accepted the idea that forgiveness is accepting someone's apology, right? It happens especially when you have little kids. Your daughter does something to your son and you say, apologize, right? And you train them kind of that apology is very important, right, in the process of forgiveness. But that's not, how, that's not how it works with God because the word apology actually is not even in the Bible. I don't know if anybody can find it, but I, I cannot find it. The word apology is not in the Bible. The idea of apologizing to somebody, it's not in the Bible. Apologizing is not a part of the forgiving process. It's not a condition of forgiving someone. Someone doesn't have to come and ask for forgiveness in order for you to forgive that person. So Luke chapter 23, verse 34 says, Father Jesus, while he was on the cross, forgive them for they know not what they're doing. Guess what? They were not repenting. They were not apologizing. And Jesus was praying that they are forgiven. No sign of apology uh, that occurred on that day. So we tend as humans to put conditions on forgiveness. But we are not supposed to because we are not God. Now, with God, forgiveness is conditional, right? God puts condition on forgiveness. God doesn't just forgive you. God looks for the fruit of repentance before he grants forgiveness of sins. And it's sad that sometimes people, we look also for fruit of the fruit of repentance before we say, okay, I'm going to forgive you. But just because God does that, we cannot expect that before we forgive them. So if everybody was unconditionally forgiven, then everybody would go to heaven. God just forgives everybody unconditionally. And although this is very much part of the social gospel that many are trying to preach, um, it's absolutely false. If this was the case, everybody goes to heaven. It wouldn't be a narrow path that few would find it. 
it will just be a big old wide path and everybody can find it because how easy it is to go to heaven if you don't have to um, if you don't have if God just forgives unconditionally right and Jesus has given us a parable to teach us about forgiveness in Matthew chapter 28 uh, 18 we see there um, um, the king I'm, I'm sure you're familiar about the story but the king took an audit and found that one of his employees his books were out of balance and uh, looking closer he realized that he was short about 10,000 talents that were missing and in US currency 2022 um, it's about six billion dollars that's billion with a B so that's a lot of money something that someone could not possibly pay in, in their lifetime so it was an amount impossible to pay and the man gets down on your knees, as you know the story, and pleads with the king. And the king was so full of mercy that they are a whole lot more than actually what the man required. What did the man require? The man said, I need more time. I need more time. And the king said, it's okay. I'm just going to forgive everything that you owe me. Six billion dollars. Forgiven. You know the story very well. And you know what happens next. Because this is a picture of what God has done for you. You have a debt of sin so large that you can never pay. That's why Jesus gave such staggering, such astronomical amount of $5 billion. Unless you are Jeff Bezos, I guess, or you cannot repay that, right? So you can't be good enough, rich enough, religious enough, smart enough to really come up with, with that kind of debt. So your sin, your sin debt, if you want to call it so, is so huge that there's no way you can pay God. And in, 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 in actuality, even if you have one sin, that is enough to, to, for you to be condemned to eternal damnation. Because you cannot, on your own, remove that sin if it wasn't for, for Jesus. So the king here represents God who made a plan to have your sins paid, covered, when he sent Jesus to the cross. But that's not the whole story. Because we have here the hypocrisy of forgiveness. Because you know what happened. That servant that was just forgiven, he goes on his way. I imagine he was happy, should have been happy. And bumps into his, one of his servants that owe him a hundred denarii. 2020 US currency, $10,000. Still a little no pocket change, but big difference, right? And what happens is that he wants to collect his outstanding debt, threatens the man, I'm going to put you in jail. And the man says the same, please give me more time. He says, nope, no more time. And he tosses him in jail. And what happens next is that those that knew him could not believe that this would be happening that he would do such a thing when he himself was forgiven of such large amount of money. And of course, the king finds out, and you know what he says, how could you, how dare you do this, what I've done for you, and you did not have the mercy to forgive your, your fellow servant the amount, such mu so much smaller amount. So the lesson for this is that God has forgiven you. This is not about them now. This is about you and me. That God has forgiven me and you so much. A debt that we could never pay back. So how dare we? How dare you? How dare me? How, how dare I not forgive someone who has sinned against me? That's something that God does not understand. So it doesn't matter what they have done against you. It's nothing in comparison to what you've done against God and in comparison with what God has done for you, right? Given his son for you. So God's forgiveness has given you a home in heaven, has kept you from eternal torment. And how can you not forgive someone a miserly, earthly offense of $10,000 when God, spiritually speaking, has forgiven you $6 billion worth of sin? And that's just a figure of speech just to really point out of how much God has forgiven us. So you see, it's for this reason that God says you have to forgive 
your fellow men when he sins against you. So forgiveness is not an option. It's not just a good idea. It's not a suggestion. It's a commandment of God that we are to obey. If somebody sins against you, you are to forgive them. And move out of the way and don't let that be a burden from you, for you. Because if you carry that into heaven, uh, you're going to be um, prevented from going to heaven if you try to bring somebody else's sin with you when you try to enter heaven. So, as I mentioned, when it comes to the basis of forgiving others, we are not to forgive others on the basis of whether or not they deserve it whether or not they are worthy, whether or not they have apologized, none of that matters. Forgiveness is based on the fact that God has forgiven you. I mean, it's such a simple concept, but God has forgiven you, therefore you forgive others. No conditions. You're not God to put conditions. Because you see, you are just a human being just like me. I've seen, you've seen, we're in a different class. And you're not God. God can say, I expect something from you first. But we cannot do that to each other. And oftentimes, you know, it can be that you have a brother that sins another brother against another brother. Or it can, may not even be a Christian that sins against you and you don't forgive them. It's possible that that person moves on, you hold that grudge, and then years later, maybe that person repents. Maybe that person... Ask God to forgive and moves on and that person is forgiven and then here you are uh, holding on to that sin of that person that will prevent you to go into heaven. So you remember Stephen, right? So he didn't have a very warm, fuzzy feeling towards those people that were st uh, stoning him. But he made a choice. He made a decision to forgive. In Acts chapter 7 when he was stoned, it says there that then, falling on his knees, he cried out loud, with a loud voice, says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said this, he fell asleep. So, even Stephen, as he was being killed, right, stoned of all deaths, he said, don't hold this against them. Jesus Christ, as they were killing him, don't hold this sin against him. Then how could we hold sin against anybody, against anybody. I have a quote by this gentleman. His name is Louis Meads. He says, to forgive is to set a prisoner free and discover that that prisoner was you. You are the prisoner. You are the prisoner that is caged when you don't forgive somebody. You are the, you are the first person that is going to hurt because you're not forgiving. And you, you can see it sometimes. I have a good friend of mine. He's gone through some trauma in his life. And so often when I meet with him, I talk with him, so often he tells me about this event that happened with some people that have harmed him and how upset and how mad he is. This happened 10 years ago. And I try to tell him, you have to let it go. And you know, when you forgive, that's what's going to cut that cord and then you can be free again. Because if you're not, it just keeps you down. It just keeps you caged because you choose not to forgive. So other people's sins, your sins will keep you away at customs. Other people's sins will keep you away. And number three is that things we can bring to heaven. So you can bring to heaven your sins, other people's sins, and you cannot bring to heaven other people. Other people. So I have another picture talk about smuggling, this lady thought that she was crossing the border and that's what she was carrying. Yes, so pretty sad. Um, maybe that was a, a way to, maybe sometimes it worked in the past, but it didn't work that time. So the point is that we cannot bring somebody like that into heaven with us, whether that person is our child or our wife or somebody that we really want to go to heaven, um, we cannot do that. In Philippians chapter 2.32 says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have obeyed the gospel, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So, 
you may be, what is the spiritual application here? You may be the child of a deeply spiritual person. And I'm looking at everybody in this building that is a child, whether it's my child or Larissa or all these beautiful gifts from heaven that God has given us. And I'm speaking to them. You cannot go to heaven because your mom is a very spiritual person or your dad or your grandpa may have been an elder or a very spiritually minded person. That's not how salvation works. Salvation is a very, very individual, very personal, very intimate relationship that one has to develop with God. Now, we all have influence on each other and we all can help each other go to heaven. But when it comes, when it comes to Judgment Day, we all going to stand before God and give an account for our own sins. And you cannot say, but my dad, but my mom, and you cannot even bring them as an excuse to say, well, let me tell you, you don't understand the kind of parents I had or whether they're good or bad. So yes, you cannot go to heaven just because you are the child of a deeply spiritual person. You may be married, as I mentioned, to a righteous man or woman. You may be the husband or wife of a person that's deeply deeply spiritual and godly that is not going to they cannot bring you to heaven you cannot go to heaven uh, under their curtails right so that relationship will not save you they cannot take you to heaven with them unless you want your own salvation because nobody can do it for you nobody can do it for you so with that said I'm bringing my lesson to a close, and that is my last slide. So if you are here in the audience tonight, um, and you ask yourself, what must I do to pass the customs in heaven? The customs in heaven will be a lot more difficult to pass than at a certain border. Um, and I'm encouraging you to do what needs to be done so that when that day comes, you will pass, and God will allow you to come into heaven. And... Um, I'm sure that Brent has mentioned many times on what one must do in order to obtain salvation. I have the list there. And then living faithfully, one can assure that they will um, have passage, a rite of passage in heaven, when that day we will all face God at the customs when we are about to enter heaven. So with that said, if there's anything that we can do to help you on that journey, as we are all working to pass um, that gate of heaven one day, if there's anything we can do right now, please come forward as together we'll stand and we'll sing an invitation song. Who will follow Jesus standing for the right?